Uh, I've learned a lot today, and thanks to the other speakers for that. Um, but the thing that's probably going to go away with me is um, spinach and avocado smoothies boost your attention span. So underneath your chairs, you'll find a little shot glass. Only joking. No, nobody looked. <laughs> um, I. Uh, let me go forward. I'm going backwards. Oh. Hey. Um, when we started out in uh, monitoring indoor air quality, uh, the traditional way was to set up test equipment in one place in a building and leave it there for a day or maybe even a week. Uh, the problem with that is was it might not have been a representative day, it might not have been a representative lo uh, location, and it could give you information, either good or bad, that might lead you down the wrong path. So what we did was we uh, set up monitoring programs for people to measure uh, the key pollutants, carbon dioxide, particulates, VOCs, uh, carbon monoxide, um, and uh, bacteria and fungi in air. And we did this on a short period uh, of monitoring in lots of locations around the building. So it was a, gave us a much better spread. And we did it on uh, four times a year, typically, and not always four times, depends on the budget. But uh, we would look to do it four times a year, so we covered the seasons. And what we were looking at is any, any disparities between the outdoor air readings, which we took at the same time, and those indoor results. And also, we put them into the context of the, 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 the trend. So we were looking not just at one-off peaks, but the result over a period of time. So um, it gave us a broad, broad uh, base of information very quickly on, uh, very early on. Um, and so uh, over the last 20 odd years, we have gathered uh, millions of small bits of information about indoor air quality parameters. And I hope to be able to share some of that with you today. Uh, one of the things we earned, learned very early on was that the health and safety limits, um, either here in the UK or around the world, didn't, weren't really going to be much help to us in judging the results. Because most often the, the health and safety limits were way up here, and what we were finding was way down here. So uh, what we had to do was uh, develop our own uh, guidance on what constituted something that was out of the ordinary. Um, and basically that is what the world standard has done. And I commend them for being bold enough to set a bar as to what constitutes uh, good air quality. Um, and so and that, and that's basically what, it, what has happened. So um, we've seen lots of statistics today. The, the, the one of these that most caught my eye uh, and surprised me was the third one down. About 30% uh, uh, of w worker sick days are due to indoor air quality, uh, poor indoor air quality. So um, interesting one. Um, so today we're going to have a look at the indoor air quality parameters measured under well. Uh, we're going to compare the limits, what does well say versus World Health Organization, BREAM, and it's not a spelling mistake, well. UK workplace exposure limits, in other words the health and safety law in this country, uh, are often referred to as the wells with an L. Um, we'll also look at what we think, the, how often you're going to get failures under the well standard. Um, and what can be done about those failures uh, by way of remedial action. And we'll also have a quick look at any measures that could be taken in the assessment process to enhance the uh, air monitoring information that comes out in a, in a sensible and cost-effective way. So there's lots of guidance out there about indoor air quality. Uh, a lot of it's been around for, for a long time. Um, and it can get quite confusing because everybody sets different standards. Uh, where do the well uh, limits sit? Most of these are a long way below health and safety, as I mentioned. Uh, so if you do breach a well limit, don't panic. I heard somebody earlier on mention that um, uh, if they don't get the well standard certification, is their, is their building going to be tagged as unhealthy? Uh, I, I don't think this is going to be an issue if, unless, you're, unless your air quality levels are up near the health and safety limits. Um, the, the well standards are quite a tough uh, bar to jump over so um, uh, if you exceed you're probably only just failing um, and uh, I don't think you need to worry too much about the results if, if in terms of health and safety you're not going to be killing people if you fail the well standards in most cases. Um, moving on to VOCs uh, um, 
What are they? They are basically chemical compounds that uh, at room temperature and pressure turn into a gas. So a good example would be nail, nail varnish remover, um, acetone. Take the lid off and if you left it off long enough it would off gas into the atmosphere. Uh, it has a smell about it and that's typical of VOCs. Uh, they are found in many finishing products in buildings, which is why they're of interest to us. Uh, there are over 10,000 individual VOCs. Uh, most of these are not a problem in terms of health and safety, uh, health to humans, that is. Um, but there are some notable exceptions, formaldehyde being one of them, which is why formaldehyde is of, of specific concern to us. So to give some idea of where the, the well standard sits, um, the, the, in the UK, there is no health and safety limit for um, total VOCs, because it's, but there, there are for the individual VOCs, but there isn't one for the cumulative number of all of them being measured together. Um, but I did find some, uh, there is some EU uh, guidance that says that 25,000 micrograms per cubic metre uh, is considered to be toxic, so anything above that level. Uh, EU also issues a discomfort figure of 3,000 micrograms. Uh, Briam sits at 300 micrograms, so a factor of about 80 times less than the EU toxic level. And the well standard sits at 500 micrograms. And I was really pleased to see that well have uh, got a slightly higher level than Briam, because as you probably know, Briam tests are done at pre-occupancy in a building, so post-construction or post-refurb, pre-occupancy. Uh, whereas the well standard is done post-occupancy. So there are people around, and what do we do? We put on deodorants and things like that. Uh, we wear clothing, like new clothing will give off VOCs. Uh, we do stuff that will create VOCs. We bring stuff into the office with us that has VO give off VOCs. So I'm glad to see that there is their, their, their bar is set slightly higher than for pre-occupancy. But the limits are quite tight. They're not going to be easy to achieve. I'll get some data on that. Um, around 87% of our current VOC testing in, under the BRIAM environment, that is pre-occupancy, uh, pass, the, pass the BRIAM limit. Uh, and about a further 5% would currently pass the well limit. But bearing in mind this is pre-occupancy. Post-occupancy, we haven't really done any of these tests yet because we haven't had any well tests come through. So we don't really know using this method whether... Um, many are, what, what the effect of the occupancy is, is likely to be, but prob there is going to be some effect. Uh, but currently, majority of tests pass the, uh, pass the BRIAM limit. Uh, for formaldehyde, this um, uh, echoes the sentiment about health and safety limits being way up above the BRIAM and well uh, limits. Um, 2,500 uh, micrograms per cubic metre is the UK health and safety limit. Um, World Health Organisation and BRIAM are, are aligned at 100. And the well standard is tighter than uh, BRIAM at 32 micrograms. Um, under our BRIAM tests, uh, almost all of the tests pass, the vi pass formaldehyde. You've, we've had a few failures, um, but the vast majority of them pass the BRIAM limit for formaldehyde. Um, of, of these, only about 60% of them would pass the well limit, and this is before we got to occupancy. Uh, most of them are there or thereabouts in terms of the well standards. Uh, um, so what this means is that uh, we need to drive harder on the products that are brought in in refurb um, to have low emitting products. Um, particulates are measured under well. Um, it's important to note that the well standard is not about personal monitoring. This would be where, the, where you're measuring for a specific type of dust, let's say wood dust. Uh, hardwood dust is a carcinogen, so um, you would do a test under COSH for having a personal pump here and a little sample tube up near, near here. Um, to give you some idea of the uh, sizes of dust particle we're talking about here, human hair is 150 microns, or the average human hair that is, uh, or PM150. Uh, tiny specks of dust that you can see are about 25 microns. Uh, well requires us to measure 10 and 2.5 microns. Now these sound really small, but in fact PM10 is actually quite big in 
technology nowadays, quite big particles, uh, is what was measured, uh, was used as a, a tool for measuring vehicle emissions. So diesel, dirty diesels was the phrase 20 years ago, and the car industry patted themselves on the back about how they cleaned up their act and got emissions down. Well, in fact, what they were doing was they were measuring PM10 readings, and they were saying, yeah, look, we've got our PM10 reading right down. But in fact, what was happening was they were just putting in better filtration, the engines were more efficient at grinding up the particles, so they were making the health problem even worse by creating lots of smaller particles, because these are more dangerous to health. Um, but the PM10 reading came down, so they look good. Uh, and this is why uh, small particles are uh, more dangerous, because they can get down into the respirable area of the, of the lungs. And there are some uh, research papers that talk about really tiny particles, that is less than one micron size, um, being able to be absorbed into the blood and passing around and possibly causing issues up in the brain uh, of dementia and so on. So uh, watch this space on that one. Um, uh, if you bought a, a dust sampling uh, kit now, the chances are it will probably measure smaller particles down to one micron, um, and maybe maybe smaller. Um, about 10 years ago, we bought a particle counter that, count, that measured all the PM10s and the PM2.5s, but also really tiny particles. So we've got quite a lot of useful data, or interesting data, I would say, not so much useful, but uh, interesting data about tiny particles, and it's... Um, we, we use these as a guide to whether there's an issue in a building or not, as well as PM10 and PM2.5. Um, looking back at, across our history of data, um, I, I, I would say if we, if we were uh, judging the well standard against those places where we've been doing monitoring, um, about 75% of the tests that we do will, will pass, and that means quite a lot of them are going to fail. Uh, that's without taking any remedial actions. The timing of any testing that you have done for, for part, well, that you do for particulates is important. You want to avoid uh, any activity going on in the space that might create lots of dust. Uh, so vacuuming, uh, any building work going on, or even changing the photocopier cartridge will release some dust particles if it's nearby to where we're doing any testing. Radon is another uh, 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 pollutant that is um, measured under well uh, it is caused by the decay of uranium coming up through through rocks um, and it's linked to over a thousand deaths in the UK from cancer uh, the the well limit is the same uh, for domestic properties it's slightly different slightly higher for commercial I don't understand quite why I guess the theory is that you'd spend more time in the home than at work but not, not for some people um, but I, so I don't know, don't know why we have a different limit in the UK um, the, the remedy is underfloor ventilation, which is a little bit difficult to retrofit in some places. Um, there is a very good website that tells you your radon hotspots, and it's not just the southwest of England. It's, it's interesting to see little pockets all over the, all over the country. Uh, but the radon test is relatively simple, straightforward to do, um, yeah, and it's one of the well things. Carbon spot the deliberate error. Carbon monoxide, that should read. Uh, carbon monoxide and ozone are, um, the well stands quite close to the UK workplace exposure limit. Um, and most of the tests that we would be doing, we have done, pass these comfortably. Um, uh, something is, is seriously amiss if, if, if they don't. So we would be waving our flag and saying, hey, there's something going on here if we get a reading above anything more than very low. Um, what can we do about it if we get a failure? Uh, well, this would depend on how high the result is, so how much, how close to those workplace health, safety and welfare uh, limits are, are we getting, um, how many tests are breached, so if you only get one out of 100 tests have failed the, failed the limit, your, 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 your action would be different to if lots of them have failed and the sensitivity of the environment. So if you're in a healthcare setting, you, you might have a different degree of urgency on the actions than you would el elsewhere. So you, you, you need to be thinking carefully about taking good advice about what, what actions might be appropriate. And here are some of those options. 
Um, addressing any likely causes, uh, you might have seen during the testing something going on that might have influenced the results in a bad way. So you might have seen somebody putting on a sealant uh, or doing some other activity that might have influenced that result. Um, so they're not still putting the sealant on, it's already been done. So the chances are you, there is nothing you can do remedial action wise in that case. Uh, you might retest, you might include that area uh, and that parameter in a program of regular monitoring to keep an eye on it to see how much of an issue it might or might not be. You might repeat the flush out um, uh, e either by a simple format would be opening the windows and doors if you can open them uh, to just flush out any build up of pollutants that there might be. Uh, you might uh, carry out a full mechanical flush out. Uh, you might also trace the source. Um, you, you can we have an electronic sniffer that we can sniff around with for sources of VOCs um, or, or other pollutants. Uh, or you can check the product listings again to make sure that those weren't, uh, you didn't bring in something during any recent work. There are also something called photocatalytic treatments, uh, which is basically a treatment you can apply to glazing that uh, turns that glass into a catalytic converter. Um, it's an interesting theory, not terribly expensive to do. Uh, I've seen some peer reviews, it's, interesting. Uh, it's an interesting development. Um, and then the, the more expensive options for remedial action would include uh, filtration measures, uh, installing or upgrading any existing pre-filters, ultraviolet light, high efficiency or higher efficiency than you've already got filters uh, and catalytic converters uh, in your in your aircon if you've got room and money uh, so those would be things for more serious um, serious ongoing issues um, there are some sensible cost-effective enhancements that you could in increase the uh, benefit of any uh, air monitoring exercise with um, you could do an occupant survey, it costs very little to do. Uh, it would help you to focus in on any areas of concern that the people are, might be experiencing. Um, so before you come and do any testing, let's uh, see what people are saying. There might be some pollutants that you might want to add to the standard list to address any issues. Um, you could do some snapshot electronic tests. Uh, you may know that the well standard has major and minor test locations. Well, the major ones require two hours of monitoring, um, whereas you could add to that uh, some brief snapshot tests around the whole floor rather than just do it in that one place, give you a much broader picture for very little extra cost because the biggest cost is getting you there with the test equipment. Um, so to do some extra tests gives you uh, uh, more information. You can include CO2 monitoring. Most people don't have the sensors already fitted. CO2 is almost certainly going to be measured by the equipment you're using anyway, so it's a freebie. Uh, it's a little bit of um, interpretation time and thought. Uh, very useful indoor air quality measurement in CO2. Uh, you could boost your IAQ assessment by carrying out a ventilation system survey. There is a <coughs> British standard for, the, for doing this to see how dirty the ductwork is, including measurements uh, against the standard for how dirty the ductwork is and whether it should be cleaned. This is probably a pre-well uh, measure or pre-refurb measure because if it does need clean, it's quite a disruptive thing. Um, you could also do microbiological sampling, and I would do this if you had an, isu an, an issue in the building before with the predominance of colds or f flus, um, or if there was a dampness issue in that building, uh, either condensation or actual flooding or anything like that, then I would want to see some microbiological sampling added uh, again. So summing up, the well limits are generally much tighter than health and safety, so if you get a breach, don't panic. It's probably not very, very much above it. And... Uh, there are easy and cost-effective enhancements to indoor air quality. Um, and finally, may I wish you all a good air day. Mm -hmm.